Well, as I shared last week, uh, that was going to conclude our series through pursuing holiness. And I was praying through where to go next. And the Lord led me to the book of Colossians. So we will be going through the book of Colossians for however long that takes. And it will be an in-depth study, as you can see by the, the sheet you have before you, that uh, we're going to get into some deep things with the verses. And I hope it's encouraging to you because it's another great book of encouragement. And we all need a little encouragement, don't we? Amen. Well, let's open up in prayer and then we'll jump right in. Father, we thank you for the joys of the day. We thank you for the blessings you've already given us. And we thank you that we were able to minister to Glenn and his wife, Tammy, who's celebrating her birthday today, and just ask that you would allow them just to have a special time of celebration. And we pray for this study as we embark on a new beginning through the book of Colossians, and that you would just speak to our hearts and minds and let us see the things that you want us to see, and let us uh, implement and, and uh, be encouraged by all the things that you have for us in the future. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the situation at Colossae, when Paul was addressing the Christians there in this letter, was similar to what America is experiencing today. A church planter by the name of Epaphras came to a town and he started the church in Colossae. He was a solid Bible preacher who preached the gospel. And when people heard it, when people heard it and understood it, they accepted it, they were baptized, and then they joined the church and they started that maturation process uh, as new believers. And that's what should happen in any solid biblical church. And that's what was happening here. And this was a good church with solid people there who loved one another, who loved the Lord. But like many of the New Testament churches, they had been exposed to people who questioned what they were doing and criticized and cast doubt upon the faith that they were following uh, because it was something new. Well, people were not preaching the gospel who were trying to lead them away from it. And those people who were trying to negatively influence the church there at Colossae and also other New Testament churches. And this particular group that was affecting this church was the Gnostics. And Gnosticism, as you see on your paper, is a system of false teachings that existed during the early centuries of Christianity. And it came from the name Gnosis, which is the Greek word for knowledge. And the Gnostics believed that there was some special knowledge that was the way to salvation, that they would receive it from somewhere, and that's how they would be saved. They had no particular creed, so they were not always in complete agreement. They were varied on what they thought took place. But they did not believe that a relationship with God could come solely by God's grace and faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't hold to that doctrine that we hold dear as Christians. They saw the religion as sort of some very elite club that required a special kind of knowledge in order to gain access to it. Not the kind of knowledge you would get from study or from the classroom, but some secret knowledge that only could be passed on to them from some unknown source. They didn't believe Jesus to be all that the Bible claims that Jesus is. Some of them even denied the deity of Jesus Christ. He was a man but not God, or he was a God but not man. They, they couldn't reconcile that in their own thinking. Um, he was, he was uh, only seemed to be a man. They believed that God was good, and they believed that all matter, which includes the flesh, was evil and wicked, so therefore... Jesus could not be the God-man because that would be God intermingled with evil. And that was their logic behind it. Well, John warned us about this in 1 John 4, 1, where he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. Well, some of these Gnostics, they hung around for a while, and they remained connected to the to the Judaism and to the church and to the traditions of the day and the rituals. And they tried to infiltrate wherever they could. Well, Gnosticism ran completely contrary to the message of the Apostle Paul. And even to Paul, knowledge was essential, but it was not so much about what you know, rather it was about who you know. And it was through Jesus Christ. And the message of Paul, which was the same message of Jesus, which is the same message that the Bible 
teaches us is that salvation begins that relationship with God, which is established only one way. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Salvation does not come by any specific action that we take. We can't work for it. We can't have some special knowledge to gain it. Salvation is not something we do for ourselves. It is something that God and only God, through His Son Jesus Christ, does for us. Paul said in verse 9 of Ephesians 2, it's not a result of works so that no one can boast. So here we are. The church of Jesus Christ gathered here at Azalea Trace, gathered together for a Bible study, and every one of us has become a part of Jesus Christ's family. We've been adopted into the family. We're co-heirs with Christ in the very same way. Through faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ, by an extension of God's grace. That's how we're all in the family. That's the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except, no one comes to the Father except through me. And his wonderful grace is marvelous. And this is the only message that you will ever hear this preacher share about how we become a Christian. It is by faith in Jesus Christ, and by the grace of God. The whole gospel and nothing but the gospel. But here's another fact. You can come in and you can hear the gospel preached. And then you can go home. You can watch television. You can read a paper for those that are still in print. You can look at a magazine. You can listen to a radio program. You can listen to a podcast. You can talk to somebody. You can even visit another church. And you'll be exposed to all kinds of junk. Can I get a witness? It ain't the gospel what's being proclaimed out there. A lot of it is a false gospel. Stuff that will make you question or doubt what you believe or make you unsure about the things you know to be true from reading God's Word. That's why the Bereans were such a great model in the Scriptures. Because they tested everything that they heard against the Word of God. And if it matched up, if it lined up with the Word of God, then they would accept it. But if it didn't, they would reject it. And we have to be diligent like they were. Because, folks, cult religions have permeated our society. They've complicated the gospel beyond belief. So many of these religions, so-called Christians, claim to be that way. And they say they use the Bible, but they don't read from it. They don't follow it. They don't adhere to it. They don't believe all that it says about Jesus Christ and who he is. Just go talk to a universalist from the Unitarian Church. They'll agree that Jesus was God in the flesh who died on the cross, but they don't believe that any kind of faith response is necessary. And they believe also that it's just one way. There's many ways to God. If you listen to Oprah Winfrey, which I hope she's almost on the way out because she's led so many people astray, but she'll deny the exclusiveness of a relationship to God only comes through Jesus Christ. She says that's not the only way to God. One religion is just as good as another. God approves of all religions. Certainly it's not exclusive. Well, that's what Jesus said. He is the only way. But she doesn't believe that. She says Islam's a way to God. Hinduism is a way to God. Humanism is a way to God. You just fill in the blank and you can find your way to God. Well, that simply is not the truth. The Bible teaches something totally different. If you watch movies or if you watch television shows, heaven is typically portrayed as a wonderful, beautiful place, which we all know it is. But they portray it as people go there because if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, then they're going to get accepted into heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches either. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ and by God's grace. If you go to some churches, you'll hear some pastors urging the congregation to serve in this ministry and that ministry, and they admonish you to stay away from evil, not as evidence of their salvation, but in order to keep your salvation. You have to do certain good works. You have to do certain ministries in order to maintain your salvation. It's a works-oriented salvation, not salvation through God's grace. And that will lead you astray. These preachers that we talked about a minute ago, you'll discover many of them have been 
distracted by so many different worldly things, causing them to lead people astray. Y'all have heard about the, the preacher that said, I need a million dollars given to me so I can buy a jet plane because God said I needed a jet plane, right? I mean, there's just, <laughs> then you got this guy selling holy water. If you send me $5, I'll send you this holy water and you'll have money in your mailbox next week to pay your bills. That's the prosperity gospel. People are trying to sell this garbage to people. They say that our faith can compel Christ to do something for us right now. But if we don't send money into that particular ministry, then God's not going to act. Can you believe that people fall for that? Well, they do. Some others are so caught up with end time events. And this is something that has really been a stronghold in many people's lives. They're, they're so uh, curious and, and so desiring to know what's going to happen at the end. And I tell you, folks, if God wanted us to have clarity on what's going to happen, he would have put it in his word. He wants us to live every day as if it's our last day. That's how we should be living our lives, expecting that God is going to come today. We don't know the hour. Jesus didn't even know the hour. So if you've got some shyster telling you that God is coming on the third day of the second Tuesday of the month, you know he's lying. Because it ain't going to happen. But so many people are caught up defending some translation of the Bible. They're trying to defend some belief of how the world is going to end and what heaven's going to be like and all of these different things. Well, the gospel was being proclaimed at the church in Colossae and the Bible will be proclaimed here from Isaiah Trace, which reveals the gospel. But just like in Colossae, People here today can walk out of the building and you can be bombarded with all sorts of junk and false teachings that threaten to weaken and cast doubt on the gospel. Well, when Paul hears what's going on at the church, he writes them a letter and it's a letter of encouragement. It's a letter, a letter that was meant to set the record straight. It was meant to reaffirm their faith and it was to reaffirm the truth about the gospel message. And that, my friends, is a message that we all need to hear. Amen? So today, as we begin our journey through Paul's letter to the Christians at Colossae, Jesus is all that was needed then. And guess what? That's all we need today. He's still all we need. So in setting the record straight and building that foundation that would endure all the heresy that could be thrown at them, Paul starts at the starting place. He begins by confirming the truth and the power of of the gospel. Read these first eight verses with me from Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it always does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Well, here after this very friendly greeting, Paul jumps right in to the beginning uh, and begins to explain to the Colossians why the good news is such good news. First of all, the good news is such good news, the gospel is such good news, because it's a message about Jesus. Since we have heard of your faith in who? In Christ Jesus. It wouldn't be the good news unless it was about Jesus Christ. He is the who and also what Jesus do has done by going to the cross on our behalf and taking on the sins of the world and being punished unjustly so that we might find salvation. And we see the implication in our text here and all throughout the letter that Jesus is unquestionably the theme that runs all through the entire book of Colossians. Some scholars say that Colossians is the most Christ-centered book in the entire Bible. And I would tend to uh, uh, agree with that with a few caveats. 
But the gospel message is about Jesus doing something incredibly wonderful. Not for himself, not for God the Father, but for you and I, for us. And many Christians are so confused about what the gospel truly is. They don't understand how to articulate the good news in simple terms. Some have the idea that the gospel is something that is abstract, that you can't really put your finger on it. But we take important truths and doctrines from various places in the Bible and we put them together and some people think that's the gospel. Well, my hope is that when you leave here today, that if you're asked what the gospel is, you can tell them clearly and articulate it simply. Because the gospel is not something that's abstract. It's not uh, something that you have to wonder about. It is historical, it is specific, and it is factual. It's a simple story. It's a powerful story about a three-day event that took place in history, and it's an event that changed the world forever. It was not something that happened by chance. It was something that took place exactly at the time that God ordained it before you and I were even created. Before the world was created, it was ordained. It was always plan A, not plan B. And it's basic to everything that we believe as Christians. And it's the single message that has been repeated by pastors over the millennial for every sermon that's been preached. And it was done by Paul through the letters that he wrote in the New Testament period. And he is so concise when he shares the gospel here. Now, I would remind you, brothers of the gospel, I preach to you which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6. That is the gospel message. There it is. Four simple facts. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And he was seen by witnesses. That is the gospel that's what it is. Now, if you want to explain what all that means, that can be a long conversation. But that is the simplicity of the gospel. It was all predicted by the Old Testament prophets that it would take place. And it was all part of God's great reconciliation act on our behalf of dealing with our sin problem and providing for us a way as sinners to have a relationship with a totally righteous and holy God who cannot look upon sin. Our relationship with God, our faith, our being forgiven, our salvation, eternal life was all made possible by that event that took place by Jesus over that, that period of time. It's such a simple story. Paul says it this way in Romans 1.16. He says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And I've got one more thing that I think needs to be said. The gospel is not only the foundation for our faith, but it should also be the test for truth. We allow the truth of the gospel, when we do so, to permeate in our lives, it affects our belief system and it affects our thinking. And then we're able to judge everything else that we see and we hear by that standard. John, who was also dealing with Gnosticism in his church, would say it this way in 1 John 4, 1. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see that they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the enemy has his minions, and he's going out, and he wants to distract any believer from doing what he can. In fact, I read in a devotional today something that was really profound because it was so true. He said, if the enemy can keep you from praying, he's one. He fears Christians praying. Because if you're not praying, if you're doing Bible studies and you're talking about it and you're doing all these things, there is no power without prayer. Reading the Bible and prayer go hand in hand. That's why I wanted to lay that foundation for us before we got into anything else. Because he fears prayer. Because what does prayer do? It calls on the power of God. And Satan fears the power of God. 
And when we go to him and we, we ask for things to be done in his will, folks, Satan has to run. He has to flee because he has no power over God. There's some pretty appealing ideas out there, and many have fallen in recent years, to, particularly to the prosperity gospel. If you got enough faith, you can get anything you want. You just have to believe and, of course, send money to their ministry. And so many people would love for that to be true. But it's quite simply not the truth. They might mention God. They might mention Jesus. They might talk about Scripture. But one prominent prosperity gospel preacher out of the state of Texas, he will never talk about sin. He doesn't preach about it. He preaches about how God good is to us. Is God good to us? Yes. But he's much more than that. Here's the thing. If the gospel was a story about Muhammad or Confucius or Buddha or about someone else who's dead, someone who didn't have the power over death, would that be any good news? That wouldn't be good news at all, would it? Well, Jesus Christ is the only person who's ever raised from the dead and is still alive. Jesus raised a few people from the dead, but they're dead and buried, and you can go to their tombs. Jesus' tomb is empty. And that's why we know that it's truth. The second thing about the gospel is it's a message for all the world. The gospel is good news because it's a message for the world. The gospel does exactly what it says it will do. It will do it anywhere, anytime, and for anyone. And as you look at verse 6, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day that you heard it. Paul, he preached the gospel everywhere he went. He taught the scriptures everywhere he went. And he would preach to anybody who would listen. He didn't care who his audience was. He had no reservations. He had no prejudices. And he was a firsthand witness that it worked in the whole world. Jesus said in John 3, 16, that the gospel was for who? Whosoever believes in him. Paul told the Corinthians that the gospel was for all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. In Acts 2, 21, Peter says in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You notice how in any of those verses... There's one more here, Acts 16, 31. Paul and Silas tell the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Is there any exclusion there to calling on the name of the Lord? Does it say if five people call on the name of the Lord out of 10, then those five will be saved, but not the 10? If all 10 call on the name of the Lord, all 10 will be saved. The gospel is for everyone. So if we want to make disciples, we must never forget about the power of, of the gospel message. It is for everyone in the world with no exceptions. We don't have a good enough reason, folks, to withhold the gospel from anyone. And I've shared this illustration on a number of occasions for different reasons, but it's the same point. How many times when we find a great deal on something do we keep quiet about it? We just can't do it, can we? Man, I found this suit. It was on sale. It was an Italian suit, the finest suit you can buy. It was down at Belk, and they had it on sale for 75% off. And it was originally priced $1,000, and I got it for less than $200. What a bargain, right? Or you go to this new restaurant, and their food is fantastic, and you just enjoyed the meal. The service was perfect. Not a mistake was made. Everything was right on time. Are you going to keep quiet about it? Some of you might, because you don't want anybody to know about it. But no, you're going to say, I found this great restaurant, right? Or if you find a deal in some other area with consumer goods, you're going to tell everybody about, man, they got stuff marked down at that grocery store, 20% less than the, the one up the street. You need to go shop there. You'll save a bunch of money. So why do we keep quiet about the gospel? That is the greatest news we could ever share with anybody. We seem to keep it to ourselves. That gospel is just for me. No, it's not. The gospel is for everyone. There is no exception. It overcomes all barriers. But it is exclusive. And that's a good thing. 
because it has a very narrow path. And in fact, as I shared already from John 14, Jesus said, there's only one way. And if you try and find your way to heaven any other way, you won't get there. The road to destruction is wide and broad and there are many who are on it. But the road to heaven is narrow and few will find it. The gospel story is about Jesus. And it's a story that everyone needs to hear. And it's for everyone all over the world. And it's the only story that is powerful enough to save us from damnation. In Acts 4.12, Peter was before the Jewish leaders and he was speaking about Jesus and he said this, and many of you probably have this verse memorized. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And Jesus said in John 3.16, whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. If you travel the world or study cultures throughout the world, you'll discover that each, color, each culture has a predominant religion within their culture. Unless that predominant religion has a basis in the gospel, then its followers and all of their sincerity are walking down a road that leads to destruction. This is why we send missionaries all over the world. This is why we have just one gospel. This is why we tell about that one powerful, truthful story that saves. And it's for all the world. And that's why Jesus left us instructions. Because we get to be a part of God's plan for taking the gospel out into the world. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of what? Five nations? Just, just in the uh, Western Hemisphere? Just over in China? Just down in Australia? No, all nations. And it's a, me a major reason why Jesus sent his Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 tells us you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be what? My witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness shares what he sees. A witness tells what he uh, got to observe. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. And where? To the end of the earth. Few things in life are for everybody. But ladies and gentlemen, the gospel message is for the entire world. And we don't need to cease doing everything we can, whether it's going ourselves, whether it's telling ourselves, or helping support ministries that will do so to get the gospel message out there. The gospel message is such good news because it's also a message that changes lives. It's a message that changes lives. We all know that it's good news that for us as Christians, we're not going to hell, right? That's great news. That's wonderful news. And we can share about that aspect of the gospel. But the good news is even better than that. It's the fact that we get to spend eternity with Christ in heaven. And we'll be there with all the saints. That should put a smile on your face. And when the gospel is planted in us and it begins to do its thing, it transforms us. It changes us. Verse 6 again says, It is bearing fruit and it is increasing. That means it is a living thing that is going on inside of us and we're being shaped and molded and conformed into the image of Christ and it is bearing fruit because of the Holy Spirit. We're being fruitful and we're increasing in our faith. And he says, As it does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth. Changing lives is something that is inherent in the gospel message. Paul was crystal clear when he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creation. The old one has passed away. Behold, the new one has come. So that tells us clearly that the old man is gone. We've got a new man that is rising up in its place that is a result of the gospel message and the Holy Spirit within us. And Paul speaks of this change taking place in the church at Colossae. 
because the gospel has enabled them to live a life that is pleasing to God because it allowed them to live life every day by what? By faith. They were to live it by faith and it changed them into a people who genuinely loved one another. Verse four, if you go back to that, it says Epaphras has made known to us your love in the spirit. So he's giving testimony of the love they have for one another. And then in verse, uh, that was verse eight rather, in verse four, it says, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. So not only do they love one another, they love God, they love Christ, and they love all the fellow believers that are there with them. That's only the kind of love we can get from Christ. That's one of those fruits of the Spirit. Maybe you've witnessed this kind of a scenario in your life at some time personally, but two people fall in love and they go ahead and get married. And at the time they're married, both of them are non-believers. They're not Christians. I don't know what they're basing their marriage on, but anyway, that happens. And then at some point in the marriage, a problem develops and one of the two spouses turns to God and gets saved. So then you've got an unequally yoked marriage. One is a believer, one is not. That causes problems. And then often in those kinds of situations, they'll say to one another, you're just not the person that I married. I hope not, because the gospel changes you. And then what happens? Sometimes they bring about change in the other person because they see the power of the gospel and what it did, and other times they run from it and they'll get divorced, which is a shame. That's why as a pastor, I won't marry unless you're a believer because I believe that is the only foundation that will sustain your relationship in this world is to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Folks, the gospel still has power enough to completely change someone. Think of the person that you believe is the least likely person ever to come to know Christ. We all met somebody like that, right? Well, that person's never going to be saved. They are just too wicked, too evil, too, too hard. They're caught up in so many things. But folks, it can change you. It doesn't matter if they're immoral. It doesn't matter if they're addicted to drugs. It doesn't matter if they're an atheist and say they don't believe there is a God. It doesn't matter if they're a criminal. It doesn't matter if they're a murderer. The gospel can change a person from within. And when the gospel is implanted in us, we are no longer the same person. We are not reformed. We're not overhauled. We are completely new creatures. We're a new creation. So that means that the gospel is not only for the world, it's really the only hope for the world. Because our world is in a mess. We turn on the news and we can see how messed up it is and how crazy it is and how what's right is now wrong and what's wrong is now right. And we don't even know which way's up anymore sometimes, it seems, by the way people are acting and the way they're talking. I mean, I see news clips of people just walking into a store. I uh, saw a clip the other day. A guy was in, in a Best Buy store and he's there looking at something on his phone to check prices or something. I don't know, there wasn't any sound to it. And this guy just walks right in, bashes him in the side of the face, knocks him to the ground, picks up his cell phone that he was holding in his hand and walks out of the store. People are walking into stores and just shoving things into a grocery cart and walking out, not paying for a thing. That's the world we live in. And then they got people that won't enforce laws that are supposed to be enforced. We've got one major issue with our southern border. But folks, they're coming in from the northern border too illegally. Laws are not being enforced. It's a crazy, messed up, upside down world in which we live in. And the only way it's going to change is by the gospel. You know, there's all sorts of initiatives. There's government programs. There's all kinds of causes and organizations that target certain problems that exist. But folks, they will have little success because they don't have the ability to change a person's soul. They might change their thinking, but they're powerless to change their life. A friend of mine who's worked in prisons for years as a chaplain here in both the Scambia County and Santa Rosa County, he said this. He said, the only true prison reform, the only way that true rehabilitation happens for criminals is Jesus. He said, that's the only way I've ever seen it truly take place. The gospel, folks, has the power to change a life. 
What our world needs today is not new ideas, not new government programs, not new ways to make people feel better. It needs new people, the kind that are created from the inside out as a result of the gospel. A man by the name of Max Andrews said this, The gospel of Jesus Christ, like a seed, is a dynamic force that shatters the hard, stony soil of sin and takes root as new life. End quote. But be warned. You don't like change? The gospel will change people. It brings change, so be warned about it. Sometimes it's even radical. Sometimes you will see some changes that you never thought were possible. But there's always change. So I ask you these questions. Do you love people? Are you living by faith each and every day? If there's no difference in the way you were before you encountered Christ to what you are today, then I would have to question whether or not you've truly been changed by the Lord. Because you can't have an encounter with Jesus Christ and not be changed. You can't. I say it like this. If, if I'm standing on the middle of I-10 and I get hit by a tractor trailer going 70 miles an hour, I'm going to forever be changed, right? That's the way it is with the gospel. You're going to be changed if, if you truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed your sins. And are following him in obedience. You know, people ask me all the time about a friend of theirs or a loved one uh, who years ago made a profession of faith and were baptized, but they never got involved in a local church. They're one of those, oh, I don't have to be in church to be saved. Well, I think you do, because you'll desire to be with people of the same faith if you truly know the Lord. Now, is that a requirement for salvation? No, it's not, but it's a, a truthful. Uh, What's the word I want to use here? It is, it is something that will come about as a result of your salvation. You'll want to be with those kinds of people. But they say, you know, they, they live just like the world. It's like they never had a change. Well, folks, we're not the judges. We know that. But we can be fruit inspectors. And if we don't see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control in their lives, then there's probably not any change within their heart. If there's no evidence of it, then the gospel's not been involved. And if the gospel's not been involved, there's been no salvation. But the good news is that it can reach them. But if you receive the gospel message, it's good news because it has the power to change lives. And fourthly, the gospel is good news. It's a message that must be communicated. The gospel is good news because it must be communicated. And this is something for each of us to know today. Maybe I should say it this way. The gospel is not really good news until it is communicated and understood. And a lot of times people receiving the gospel don't understand it. Well, the, it was clearly communicated to the Christians in Colossae because Paul speaks to them. He says, you heard the truth. You heard the gospel in verse 5. He said, you heard it and you understood the grace of God and truth. And he said that they had learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, in verse 7. It was being communicated throughout their region. And he said the gospel is going to not just be here for you. It's going out into all the world. It's going to spread like wildfire, wildfire because it was proclaimed, it was understood, and it was learned. And obviously these Colossians had received the gospel, and now they were proclaiming it to one another. The gospel, folks, is powerful enough to change lives, but it must be proclaimed, it must be understood, and it must be learned. You know, from time to time, we've had problems, like any church, with our sound system in here. And there's some people here with good hearing. But there's some who aren't able to hear unless my voice or the voice of others is being broadcasted. So when the gospel is proclaimed, they won't hear it. If our sound system's not working right. Well, the same is true in your own life. If you don't speak clearly enough to where it's proclaimed and understood, they won't learn it. We've got to learn it. Each of us has a great responsibility in that calling to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And all of us are given opportunities. And we need to look for them. That's why I put in your bulletin the last few weeks. We need to pray and ask God to give us those divine disruptions that that come into our lives daily, that we will see them, that we won't be so caught up in trying to get done with our tasks that we overlook the need that's right beside us. We never know how powerful it will be for us to pray for somebody in the moment they need a prayer 
or to, to encourage them and have a word of encouragement that the Holy Spirit will just bring to your mind when they tell you what's going on in their lives. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to come back to you again because you were there for them and you shared with them the truth of God's word and you lived it out. You were obedient to that prompting from the Holy Spirit. And if we're to obey the Great Commission, we have to proclaim the gospel in a way that's heard and understood by our listeners. And that means it must be delivered in the terms of our culture. And that's changing. We're not the same United States we were in the 1950s. Can I get an amen? It's not the same place. People don't respect authority like they once did. People don't respect professions like they once did. They certainly don't respect law enforcement anymore like they once did. But we have to think about the culture we're in. Jesus, Peter, Paul, all the Old Testament prophets, they tailored their message of truth to their audiences. So we have to be in the world in order to know the culture in which we're in. And then we've got to find ways in which to take the gospel out. The gospel message never changes, but the method in which it's delivered will change every time you go into a different culture. We have a name for that in the theological world today, and that's called being missional. Being missional has very little to do with being missions-minded. It has little to do with supporting and praying for missionaries by taking up special offerings. It has little to do with missions education or taking mission trips, or, or even though those are things we should do. But it's a mindset and a method that a church must take time to develop relationships with people. That is one of the most important things that we can do as Christians, is to develop and, and cultivate relationships, not just with other believers, but with people who are not believers. That's one of the missions I have here. I'm meeting with people that aren't necessarily uh, Christians, I'm meeting with people that are of different faiths. I'm meeting with people that have different beliefs than I do because I want to build those relationships. You know why? Number one, I care for them. And number two, because it's going to open up an opportunity for one day in the future that I don't know when that God's going to allow me to be there in their lives and help them through a time of need. And it's going to be powerful. And I, I look forward to those divine disruptions that God brings about all the time. Our culture is always changing. So the methods of our communicating the gospel must also change. So if we want people to hear, receive, and understand and accept the gospel message, only then does it have the power of God for salvation. And finally, the gospel is such good news because it's a message that's accompanied with expectation. This is perhaps the best news of all. Verses 4 and 5 of our text say, Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for, the, for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. I want to focus on one word in that whole passage. And that's the word hope. Hope. That's a term that is so flippantly used today, much like love is used today. Oh, I love this or I love that. And it just totally diminishes the meaning of what that word should truly mean. Well, the same happened with the word hope. Because it usually speaks of wishful thinking. Oh, I wish this would happen or I wish that would happen. And all you do is just replace the word wish with hope. Oh, I sure hope we're early enough in the supper line to get a good table. I hope my team gets to the Super Bowl and that they win. I sure hope the weather warms up because I can't stand this cold air in the, in the, in the outside today. Or, I sure hope the sermon's short today. But all of that is wishful thinking. But Paul is speaking of hope. You know what hope really means? It's an expectation. Hope is a confident assurance. It is a confident hope and an expectation. And the Greek word speaks of confidence, expectation, and anticipation. It is something that will happen. It's not something that might happen or could happen. It is a certainty. So when we see the word hope in the Bible, that's what it means. It's something that will happen. And Paul was delighted that the church here had the confident assurance that heaven was theirs. They knew that their lives on earth, when they were over, they were not going to just be put in the ground underneath some dirt, and that was the end of it. 
Their souls will live on in eternity in glory with our Lord and Savior. That was their hope. There was a better place. Verse 5 says, laid up for you in heaven. With most matters of faith, there's an element of the unknown. And we all deal with the elements of the unknown, right? We don't know how we're going to feel when we wake up in the morning. We don't know how we're going to feel when we try to move and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Are we going to trip and fall over something? Are we going to forget we left something in the hallway? And we, we don't know. We, we have all kinds of unknowns in our lives. And there's a lot of details about heaven that we don't know. We don't know where it is exactly. We don't know how exactly we're going to get there. We know what takes place for us to, to have the ticket to heaven, so to speak, but we don't know how that journey is going to look, right? You know, when John was on the island of Patmos, he received a vision where he actually saw heaven. And I think it was just so overwhelming and so beautiful that as he tried to describe it and what he knew of beauty on this earth, that he didn't do it justice. I don't think there's literally going to be streets of gold or a crystal sea. I think those were just the most beautiful things that he could imagine to try and express, express and explain what heaven was going to look like. I think it's going to be far beyond our expectations. I think heaven is going to be such a, a wonderful place that we are just going to be ecstatic about being there. We don't necessarily know exactly what we're going to look like. We know we're going to be recognized to some degree because... The Bible gives us an example of Jesus in his resurrected body. He was visible, but yet he could walk through walls. He still had his scars because Thomas was able to place his fingers in his side and in his hands. But he was here one minute and there the next. So there's some things that we just can't really grasp our minds about. But be assured, heaven is a real place. And when we get there, we will live there eternally. And it's a place that we don't need to wonder about or speculate about. We can be certain. It's something we can be confident of. It's something that we can expect. It's something that we can anticipate that we will be there. And the Apostle John wrote it this way in 1 John chapter 5. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we will have the request that we have asked of him. That's how we can live by faith each and every day, folks. That's why we must be loving one another. That's why we must be involved in taking the gospel message to a world that's not heard it. We don't need to be worrying about and wondering about our salvation. We don't need to be uh, wondering if we've been freed from the bondage and the penalty of sin because the Bible clearly tells us we are. We can be confident in that hope and that expectation. Anders said in his commentary, our hope is safe and secure. It is locked away in heaven, far above anything that may threaten its integrity. So if we've received and we've allowed the impact of, uh, of our lives to be changed from the gospel, then we have this confident hope. We have this confident assurance that Jesus is indeed prepared a place for us, just like he said in John 14. That, my friends, is the good news of the gospel. Things that last, things that operate properly, are built on a solid foundation a building or a house that's built only on sand will not last that's why they dig deep down into the earth and find rock and they'll put footers there so it will support that structure well a good organization is built on solid principles and a strong mission statement and folks our christian faith is built on the solid foundation of the gospel paul said it well in first corinthians 3:11. He said, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Folks, libraries all over the world are filled with millions of books which contain millions of stories, but only one book contains this story. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose from the dead. He was seen by witnesses 
And this story and this story alone is the gospel truth. So my appeal to you today is for you to examine your life right now against the gospel. Is your life, is your faith standing on the firm foundation of the gospel of Jesus? Because if we're relying on good works, if we're relying on church membership or church affiliation or something we did, Folks, those are unsure, unreliable, and false foundations. They're like sand. They will collapse. So lay those aside and build your faith on the foundation of the gospel. Then we'll ask, are we doing everything we can? Are we taking advantage of every opportunity that we have to share the gospel message to others? Do we share it to our families? Do we share it to our friends? Do we share it to our neighbors? Do we share it to those that don't have that hope and that confidence and that assurance of where they'll spend eternity. Folks, the gospel is a powerful story. It's about something that God did for you and for me and for everyone, but it must be received in order to be believed. It's our faith in Jesus Christ that brings us his forgiveness. So don't forget it and be sure to communicate it faithfully every chance you get. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to dig into the book of Colossians and for the gospel message of which it teaches us. We thank you for the way you've spoken to our hearts and encouraged us today and given us that assurance and that expectation and that hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, the gospel is good news. It is such good news. It's a message that we received. It's a message that we have to take to other people. It's a message that has the power to change lives. So Lord, I pray that we will take it seriously when we think about the Great Commission to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all the things that the Scriptures reveal. Thank you, Lord, for uh, each person in this room. And I just want to lift up any needs that they may have today that you will show yourself to be faithful and meet those needs. And it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.